Hey, everybody. Welcome to Fly Tying Monday. Hope everybody's doing well. I, uh, my camera isn't focusing too well today. I got to fix it. But we don't worry about that. I think I'm clear enough. And my fly tying cameras are clear. So that's what's important. You don't need to see. You don't need to see me that clear. Um, so we are going to tie a warm water fly today, sort of a warm water fly. I've had, I had a lot of people say, you know, let's tie some warm water flies. It's getting to be summertime. Uh, people like to fish for different species. And um, the fly today is a crayfish imitation. And I have, I have been searching for years for a reliable crayfish imitation that that I trust because everything eats crayfish. Um, everything from carp to panfish eat small crayfish, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, drum, sheep's head, uh, bowfin. Uh, there's all kinds of fish that live, catfish, channel cats. It's all kind of fish that live in, in freshwater that eat crayfish. So um, and, and I haven't, and trout, of course, trout eat a lot of crayfish too. They love crayfish. So a good crayfish imitation is something that's important. And um, I turned to my friend Drew Price for this pattern. I asked him for, for one of his personal patterns. Drew is a, is a guide on Lake Champlain. And uh, Drew specializes in fishing for, you name it, a mixed bag. Uh, Lake Champlain has, has everything from lake trout and steelhead and landlocked salmon to carp and bowfin and gar. It's what, you know, it's what's called a two-story lake because it has a cold water species and warm water species. And it has nearly everything you can imagine. Um, all kinds of species. And Drew loves to chase uh, unusual species like gar and bowfin and sheep's head and, uh, and freshwater drum uh, with a fly rod, all with a fly rod. So uh, this is Drew's pattern and he calls it, what does he call it again? Champ, champ dad crayfish. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, much about Vermont champ, is the uh, is Lake Champlain, but it's also the nickname for the uh, famous sea monster uh, that lives in um, Lake Champlain. Champ. I haven't seen Champ, but um, some people say they have. And if you know, if you follow Ben and Jerry's, you've probably heard about Champ. But anyway, uh, this is the Champ Dead crayfish. Uh, it's a it's a great crayfish imitation. It's worked well for me. And it's a go-to fly for Drew. And, uh, you know, Drew is, Drew is on, on the lake or on a river every day. And so uh, anything that, that Drew has as a reliable pattern is, um, is one that, that I'm going to use. Drew has some other patterns, too, that we'll maybe show you eventually. So anyway, this fly will catch trout. I know a lot of you are interested in trout. Trout eat crayfish. But it's a great fly if you're fishing in warm water in lakes. Um, it's not a good fly in weedy areas. It's designed to fish more in open waters. It's heavily weighted, so it gets to the bottom quickly, even with a floating line, gets to the bottom quickly. And I would probably fish this with a floating line um, or an intermediate line to kind of crawl it along the bottom. Um, but um, anyway... It, it's, a, it's a reliable fly. It's a good crayfish imitation. And uh, I'm going to be asked what colors you can tie it in. You can tie it in any color you want. I would recommend that you uh, do a little exploratory trip and look in the shallows where you fish and find out what color the crayfish are because crayfish can be can be um, orangey brown which is kind of a version i'm going to tie today they can be tan they can be olive they can be almost black uh, there's even blue colored crayfish so um you know take a look take a look in the waters you fish and and see uh 
what basic color scheme uh, the crayfish are. I don't think I don't think the exact color matching is that important, but we we all like to do that as fly tires just to try to try to imitate as closely as we can what the fish are eating. But uh, not so sure the fish care that much. But it's probably the action and the profile of the fly uh, that makes it so effective. So anyway, um, any questions before we start tying? I'll give you a, I'll give you a little look at the fly. Crayfish in the bat and kill are blue, says the Orvis company. Who the hell are they? What do they? What do they know? Um, that's not a very good view of the fly. It's a little too close. Let me just rotate it here, so you can see it. What it looks like from the business end. And then I got to move my camera. So that's what the fly looks like. And it looked crayfishy. Has the right action. Um, and again, the color, the color can be totally up to you. The color and the materials can be totally up to you as long as you kind of follow this profile. Um, so anyway, I see that we have a first timer here, Rick Smith from West Virginia. Welcome, Rick. We're we're glad to uh, we're glad to have you here. And I see that Orvis posted Drew Price's uh, website. Um, he's Masterclass Angling on Facebook and Instagram. And um, you know, if you want to, if you want to book a trip with Drew, he's um, somebody be we highly recommend. He hasn't, he just got his captain's license, and he hasn't quite started guiding full time, so uh, you won't find him in the Orvis endorsed listing. But uh, expect Drew will be Orvis endorsed soon because a lot of us, a lot of us fish with him. Can you back up a little more on the camera? Yeah, I will, Mike. Uh, I will when I get started. It's a little bit difficult because this is a fairly large fly and I need to work around the camera tying. So I'll, I will back up as much as I can, but it'll give you a better, it'll also give you a better um, a view of the steps I'm, I'm doing. So anyway, let's start tying. I'm gonna take that fly out of the vise and flip my vise around. And I'll back up a little bit for Rick, if I can still get in there. That's about, that's about as backed up as I can get, Rick. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to reach the vise from here. Now, that's the best I can do. Now, as far as hooks are concerned, you could tie this. You can tie this on any um, any stout hook. I'm going to use a jig hook for this one. And you do want a lot of weight. You do want a lot of weight with this. I am, this for this particular fly, I'm going to use a Gamagatsu, I think it's a bait hook, jig 90 degree heavy wire. Um, Stock number 60409, and it's a size two. Can tie these anything from a size two to maybe a size eight. Here's a uh, here's a size eight that I tied on a Gamagatsu uh, black bonefish hook. I'm gonna use these for carp. So uh, no, that's a size six actually. I think a size eight would be a little bit more than I'm than I'm uh, interested in tying. I think there's just too much stuff in this fly. I'd probably I'd probably modify it a little bit if I was going to tie it down in a size eight. But this nice big jig hook allows us to see things better, and this is a good size for bass and very large carp, bowfin things like that, kind of big predators. So the first thing I'm going to do is take some uh, waiting wire 
and Drew recommends 030, and I, 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 all I had is 020, so sorry, Drew. But, um, you know, the heavy, heaviest uh, weighting wire that you can find is recommended. And I'm going to put the wire on first before I put the eyes on. So I'm going to, and I like to just hold the, hold the spool in my hand. And, and I'm going to take about uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, maybe 18 turns. And if you had, if you had um, heavier wire, you wouldn't need to take as many turns. But I, I figure you, know, you want to cover about half the shank or, or a little bit more, maybe two-thirds of the shank. With some kind of weighting wire, you just want this thing to be as heavy as possible because you want it to get down on the bottom quickly. Then squeeze it together and leave it about, kind of about in the middle of the hook. And then I'm gonna take my thread, 6010, um, tie this in any color you want. You probably want your thread to match whatever body color you're doing. So if you're tying olive, you might wanna use olive uh, thread, but it's not that important. And I'm going to start my thread just in front of that lead. Lead, I call it lead, non-toxic wire. And then I'm going to put a drop of super glue on here, which I like to do with uh, these dumbbell eyes. Not coming out. I must not have cleaned the tip of that. Here it goes. Come on. Oh, I guess I'm going to have to cut that tip a little bit. Usually these uh, little tiny tubes, if you blot it after you use your super glue, you don't have to, um, you don't have to put a plug in it. So I'm going to blot this. I'm going to blot that because I got a little too much there. Just want you just want a little bit of super glue on there to keep the thread attached. And when you take your first turns around the dumbbell eyes, so I've got some dumbbell eyes here, and you can use any color you want. So I'm going, so I'm gonna go one direction here, then flip it back and go another direction. And I'm gonna just do these diagonal turns till I feel like those eyes are secured. And of course the super glue helps. And then I'm gonna take some turns around the base to further secure them and then shove that wire up in there. And at this point, you should be able to not wiggle those eyes with, you know, with moderate pressure. If your eyes turn at this point, then I would I would back up and start over again uh, because this thing won't swim properly if the eyes get misaligned. Now I'm going to come back. I have one question, Tom. Yeah. Um, and my cat Jocko is making a special appearance today. Uh, oh. <laughs> Mark's asking if you would tie this as a balance fly. Um. I don't know. I never thought of it. Maybe. <laughs> All right. That's the only question for now. So I'll pop back in with more. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I honestly don't think I would tie as a balance fly because crayfish don't hang suspended in the current. They either, they're either on the bottom crawling backwards or they're darting around. And so I don't know it, it, as a balanced fly would would be very important. Okay, helpful. But there's something to think about. Now I'm gonna uh, bring my thread over that over that waiting wire and form a little dam behind it so it doesn't go anywhere. And maybe crisscross it a few times. Make sure it doesn't slip. 
And then I'm going to take my thread around the hook bend a little bit. A little farther around the hook bend than you normally would. And I'm going to turn this upside down because I'm going to uh, tie my shell back in here. And now I'm going to take some synthetic fiber. And there's a number of things you can use. I am using, uh, what is this called? EP Sculptifly. And what this stuff is, is a EP fiber with little, little uh, glints of tinsel. I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's little glints of tinsel in there. And another option would be this stuff called uh, sculpting flash fiber, which is a very similar looking material. But any, any kind of, any nice synthetic um, that has just a tiny bit of flash in it would work. And you probably want to start with a little bit more than you think you need to make that uh, carapace, that, that shell. Um, I find that um, I cut off what I think I'm going to need and I find that, oh, I wish I had put a little bit more on there. So that's a pretty good hunk of, hunk of this stuff, but I think it's going to, I think it's going to be just about right. And then you want to kind of even the ends just to make it easier to work with first. And then you line that up. You can line it up with the end of your weight, or you can line it up with the end of the eyes, either way. Um, and you kind of, you, it's kind of tricky to grab it around this point, but you just kind of come around like that and gather it all, take a couple turns, and then pull it so it so it's, goes right over the hook point. So it's kind of centered in the hook point and wind down a little bit more on the shank because what you're gonna do is this is gonna be the back of your fly and you're gonna pull it over the top of the fly at the end. So just, and then just kind of leave it hanging there and secure these uh, front fibers by coming quickly to the front loosely so that you gather them all. And then you can come back and secure them and neaten them up. All this is gonna be bound under so it doesn't matter. but you want it on the underside of the hook, which is going to be the top side of your fly because it's going to ride point up because of this weight on the bottom. Now I'm going to flip it back. And just kind of get this stuff out of the way. Push it back around your vise or something. Probably the far side would be a better way to do it. And then bring your thread down to where it started and just let that stuff hang back there out of the way. And then you want to take a little bit, little bit less of that whatever fiber you're using. A little bit smaller amount. What a mess. Sorry, I, I really made a mess of this earlier. So smaller amount, and you want to just taper it a little bit. So just kind of hold it, hold it and rotate it and just gently, gently pull on it so that you get a little bit of a taper, not a squared off piece. This is going to imitate the kind of the front of the carapace of the crayfish. And you tie that in. Not too long, maybe about half a hook shank. Right on top of that other stuff. Wind forward a few turns. A 
cut it off. And bind down the butt ends of it. And then keep your thread right there. Now you need a, a rubber leg of some type. You can use any, any kind of rubber legs you want. I happen to like these orange ones for this fly. And just grab a piece of rubber leg like so. Oh, I didn't show you that. Not a big deal. Just a piece of rubber leg. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't switch cameras. And you're starting a little bit forward of that tail. And just fold this rubber leg over your thread. And pull it on top. And then just pull it a little bit toward you. And work back toward that carapace. And then you'll be left with a couple of antennae with a little bit of separation between them and cut those off a little bit longer than that carapace. Maybe there. I'll show you how long it is because I'm not so wide. So there's how long my rubber legs are out to here. You can make them, you can make them any length you want, but a little bit longer. Here's, here's the carapace that ends here. You can't really see it. Um, it. You'll be able to see it better once I pull that shell. There's the carapace part there. So it's the same material as what's going to be the shell back. And that's going to stick out when you're done. Okay, so now you have to make a bump. And we're going to make a bump with Senyo's laser dub, if I can find it. And you can, again, you can use um, any dubbing you want. Uh, Drew, Drew calls for Senyo's laser dub in tan. And this, again, is a synthetic fiber with a little bit of sparkle in it. But, but any old dubbing. Uh, will really work, I'm sure. And pull some of that out. And you can see it's got a, it's a fine, it's a very fine fibered synthetic with a little bit of sparkle in it. Not sure if you can see, yeah, I guess you can see that sparkle on the camera. And you're going to make a fairly good bump on of dubbing. You want this, unlike typical dubbing, you want to use quite a bit. And you want it to be bulky. This is going to be the head of the crayfish. And it's also going to be what you use to split your claws. So I'm going to wind this. And I'm going to try to wind it all in one place. Not forward, but just on top of itself. So I'm making a nice big lump there. Now you've got a you've got a lump that you can splay your crayfish claws around. And to make the claws, we're going to use grizzly marabou or chickaboo, which I can't find. There it is. Uh, Grizzly Marabou hairline, hairline distributes it. Um, it's basically soft chicken feathers that we used to throw away because <laughs> they, they were no good as hackles. They were no good as dry fly hackles. They were no good as, as saddle hackles and everybody used to throw them away. And now we've found, and they're, I think they're from a hen, but they're nice, small marabouish feathers. A uh, real marabou comes from a turkey. So this is chicken marabou. So sometimes people call it chickaboo. Um, and you want to get 
two kind of straight, nicely marked pieces, not too heavy, not too big. Um, just want the impression of a claw there. I might use, I might grab a little bit bigger ones, a little bit more sharply defined. Yeah, those two there look good. So that's what I'm going to use for the claws. And it's quite easy to put these on. You're just looking for the impression of claws here, the impression of, of something big sticking out. So what I do is I take the feather and kind of bunch it. And you want this to be, I don't know, about, about a shank length. And I put one on the far side first. I take a couple turns. And you can see that bump is going to kick those out. And when you, when you pull this through the water, the claws will, will stream behind the fly like in a natural crayfish. And then when, the, when there's no current, when there's no pressure on it, uh, they'll kick back out like a, like a real crayfish. And they wiggle and wave in the water like crayfish claws do. And then I'm going to put my other one on the near side. And I'm, I like to start it a little bit lower because the thread tends to roll it on top of that ball. So I kind of start it a little bit lower. And the claws don't even have to be even because crate. I mean, if you're, if you're fussy about it, yeah, you'll make them even. But crayfish don't even have evenly spaced claws. So not that important uh, to make them even. And then... Yeah, I like to cut these off behind the eye. And then like I did with that other stuff, hold it down, make a couple loose turns to gather that stuff so it doesn't get all over. And then you can come back and secure it nicely. Like so. So now you got your claws and your Antennae sticking out. And next, gonna put the rear legs on here. And for the rear legs, I like, let me get rid of this chickaboo here. You guys don't know how long it takes me to clean up after I finish these things. It takes me longer to clean my desk up than it does to tie. And then I'm going to take a, a big, nicely modeled hen saddle. Um, I like hen hackle. Drew uses hen hackle for the back of his um, flies because the, the legs that are in the crayfish toward the rear or toward the front of the fly are bigger than the legs that are that are more towards the the front of the fly is actually the tail of the crayfish, so um, he uses hen hackle hen saddle here, and then regular saddle hackle up here, so that the legs go from fine to heavy as you go back on the fly, which which makes sense. So I'm going to take a nice big, nice big heavily marked. Saddle, feather, hen saddle. Strip off the fuzz at the bottom. And then grab it by the tip and fold it back like so. Oh, I didn't switch cameras, did I? Ah! I'm so sorry. Nobody told me. Somebody must. Nobody paying attention out there? So that's what I'm using. Uh, a, you know, Bra Brahma, Brahma hen, uh, modeled hen feathers, uh, hen saddle. It's all the same stuff. They're big webby feathers on 
the uh, on a on a hen, and then I I stripped the fuzz off the base, and I grabbed it by the tip and pulled it back like so. Now I'm going to tie that in. put my a point where I stroked them back in there and then I'll probably pull it pull it a little bit so I have a little room to start and then I'll just come forward and bind that feather down sloppy I know but it's all going to get covered up so it doesn't matter I'm not going to even bother trimming that I might try to bind it under there okay so you got this, this is going to be palmered through the body. And then you take your laser dub again and make a, a much thinner noodle. Crayfish actually uh, are going to be thicker toward the back than towards the front because they're backwards, right? They swim backwards. We tie them backwards. So I've got some dubbing on there. Same dubbing I used for the bump. And I'm just going to wind right up against those claws and then forward to about the halfway point on the shank. And I'm going to move this a little bit here. Now we just wind our saddle hackle through the body. And I'm going to pick it up and stroke it back so that it kind of flows back like the legs on a crayfish. And you may have to twist that feather to get it to go in properly. Sometimes they don't twist the way you want them to. There it goes. But you want them to kind of stream back toward the back. And saddle hackles have thin stems, so you may have to manipulate that stem as you wind it to get those to stream back. You have to flip it around a little bit. And stroke it back as you go. That looks good. Now I'm gonna tie that stem off. Clip it. Take a couple more turns over the stem and get rid of any stuff that's in the way there. Did you notice I just cut my thread? Luckily, luckily, didn't go anywhere. If you cut your thread, no big deal. Just start over again. Now I'm going to turn the fly upside down. Actually, right side up. And I'll adjust the camera angle here a little bit. And then I'm going to separate these fibers. And you may want to come in with a dubbing needle and just get them out of the way. You could also trim these if you wanted to here. Um, you could trim them or just separate them. I just separate them. And then you're going to grab all of this stuff that you had hanging back there. And you're going to kind of center it on the eye. And then take two turns. Ugh. Hard to get in here with this camera. Take two turns. That's all you need at this point, two or three. So now you've got that carapace in the back sticking out and the legs and the claws. And then what you want to do is to get this out of the way, I like to fold it back, take a couple of turns over it just to get it out of the way. You're going to come forward with that again too, but just like that, get it out of the way. And next, 
There's a small piece of copper wire that, um, that, that ribs the front part of this. So I just got some copper ultra wire, any color, any size you want. This is the small size. You could use smaller, brassy. So just a piece of copper wire, gold wire, whatever, whatever wire you have will work. And tie this in up to behind the eyes. Getting a little messy in there. And then you're going to take a standard saddle hackle, orange or mottled brown or whatever color your crayfish are, but just take a you know, a nicely barred saddle hackle. This one happens to be grizzly dyed orange. And do the same thing you did with the other one. Strip the fuzz off the base so you can wind it easily. And grab it by the tip. Stroke it back. And you may even want to uh, give yourself some nibs on the tip. So what I'm going to do is cut the tip off because sometimes the tip's a little weak. And then just cut these fibers along the stem. These little guys sticking out will help, help this um, secure in place. less likely to pull out. And then I will tie that in, starting up against the carapace and come forward, come forward right to the, right to the eye or if you're using a jig hook like me to the point where the, the jig hook comes up. Now you're going to put some more laser dubbing on there. And this time you want your application of laser dubbing to be a little thinner because you're going to make multiple turns through the eyes. So I'm just going to dub it on kind of standard, standard diameter noodle. And you want a fairly long one fairly long noodle because you're going to crisscross through the eyes a couple times to cover up the wraps. So I may even need to add more. So I'm going to go start to wind back toward the eyes and then I'm going to go through the eyes this way and then through the eyes the other way. Do that a few times. Then come back to where my wire and my saddle hackle are. And I see I'm going to need to add some dubbing. So I'm just going to grab my wad of dubbing and put some more on there. And... Now go forward, finishing off at the eye. If you are not using a jig hook, make sure that you leave yourself a little bit of room because you got a bunch of stuff to tie off here. And um, if you're not careful, you can end up crowding the eye with materials. So uh, not a problem with a jig hook because you got the eye way up here out of the way. But if you're using a standard eyed hook, then, then it could be a problem. And then you're going to wind, kind of stroke this saddle hackle back. And it should fold backwards naturally because of the way I tied it in. And these are going to be your front legs. And it's tricky going around the eyes. You're going to get a little bit of a funniness there. A couple turns behind couple turns in front of the eyes, tie it off, a 
cut your saddle hackle. Without cutting your thread if possible. And then I do like to trim. I do like to trim this hackle flat before I pull that carapace over. I find that I, it's, I get too much leg if I, if I don't. So I'm going to trim those. And then just take that piece that's been hanging out there so patiently. And I, I bring it right over and center it. I go right through the eye. So I go right through the middle of the eye with the material. Secure it right behind the eye. And now you just cut this off to match that this is the tail of your crayfish. Like so. That's your wide tail and it'll naturally kind of splay wide like that. And now you just, and I like to take a couple turns of this wire over that exposed uh, thread there in the middle of the fly. And then I just carefully wind it through the, and it's tricky to get it to look even because of those eyes. And then I take a couple extra turns up near the front. Again, that helps protect the, the front of the fly. Tie it off. Cut your wire off. And a couple more turns and you whip finish and you're done. So that is Drew Price's Champ Daddy. Oh, and then of course, you add a little bit of the head cement of your choice. I think I'll use this deep penetrating Orvis cement because it has a nice applicator. And there you go. That's the champ daddy. Crayfish imitation. Pretty cool fly and effective. And it looks like a crayfish. Questions? questions and yes chris a six, i'm sure a 60 degree jig hook will work just as well that's that's the big jig hook that i had so um yeah uh ben i've ben i've already tied a frank sawyer pheasant tail nymph if you look back in the archives on youtube or um or uh facebook uh i've already i've already tied that fly so good good suggestion we already did it and yes, I see that some of you noticed Judd and Roger and Lee noticed that I cut my thread. So let's vote. Do I win this week? Um, any, qu any questions about this fly? Yeah, Craig says, I find the crayfish bears with understated claws. Yeah. I, I I tend to agree with you, Craig. And you know, it, it might be. I mean, not all crayfish have claws. Sometimes they lose their claws, and I I would think that that would be a prime target for a trout. So either understated claws or cut them off and and don't have any claws might be the way to best imitate crayfish. Um, but you know, we all put claws on them because that's what a crayfish looks like. All right, do I have any other questions? 
Is thinking tip better with a longer leader? You know, it, it, it's Mark. It's it's really going to depend on your on how how deep you're fishing and how much weed on the bottom or rocks on the bottom you have. If you have a, a sand or a gravel bottom, and there's not too many obstructions. I would say a, a sinking tip or even a full sinking line with this fly. If you're fishing shallows, and especially if you have a lot of obstructions, sharp rocks and logs and, and maybe some weed beds, then you may want to go with a floating line and a long leader, but um, it's going to really depend. But um, this fly will sink fast, so uh, it can be fished with a floating line because it it gets down gets down really quickly with all that all that weight you put on it. Yeah, Ed, this is not an easy one, but it's not that hard either. Take your time with this one. Um, big question is how do you like to fish it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So generally with crayfish, it's a um, it's a strip and then a stop. So um you you strip the fly and then you let it settle and that's how crayfish flee you know they they dart they swim a little bit and then they settle to the bottom and the way this fly is tied it will actually kind of kind of point up um because the, the crayfish will often point up with its claws extended and its antennae extended when it's resting on the bottom so you know alternating uh generally alternating uh quick strip and then let it settle to the bottom. And um, it's a little harder to detect strikes when fish take it on the, uh, when it's dead on the bottom or when it's sinking. But if you watch the tip of your line, that's why I like a floating line. Uh, you can usually see the tip of that line kind of kind of straighten and tighten up. Um, it, it takes a, a little practice to be able to detect strikes, but uh, it's more effective to fish them like that. You can also just fish them by stripping them uh, and and not stopping. Uh, that will sometimes work because crayfish crayfish uh, will flee and they can swim pretty fast. Uh, but you know, generally a strip strip stop strip stop strip stop is is the best way to fish them. In fishing rock drop offs for smallies in shallow river, would this fly work well with quite a bit less weight? Yeah, Mac. Um, you know, if I I would try it heavy first because um, if, even if you're in shallow water, um, you want to get that fly down to the bottom as quickly as possible, and and this will do it. So, um, yeah, you could yeah, absolutely tie it with less weight, but um, the, the heavier one, sometimes uh, especially with smallmouth bass, the the splash of this thing might actually attract them. So, because um, you want you want to get it on the bottom quickly. Any tips for Corbina on the fly in Southern California? Dan, I've never fished for Corbina, so um, I can't give you any tips. When fishing for bass in water with pike, but targeting bass, do you use a steel leader just in case? I don't, no, I don't. Um, uh, unless I'm going strictly for pike and it's mainly pike water. Uh, if there's bass and pike mixed in, I'll take my chances with getting bit off by pike and you know you can land pike on a on a non-steel leader if you know if it if the hook catches in the right place um they don't they won't chop you off so uh it you know it's a similar situation with striped bass and bluefish if i'm fishing for a striped bass uh and there's a few bluefish around i won't put wire on because striped bass don't like wire as much so it depends on what you're targeting you know if you're really targeting the pike instead of the bass then yeah use a wire leader and it may keep the bass off <laughs> Um, but if you're fishing for bass, I, I'd take the risk. I, I wouldn't put wire on. Uh, for bass in rivers in Jersey, I've always used a floating line. Any reason to use a sink tip or sinking line? Mike, it depends on how deep your water is. If, if you've got water that's, you know, five feet, five or six feet deep, then, uh, there may be a reason to, to carry a sink tip or a sinking line. Uh, the fish may not always be shallow, particularly as the fall comes, smallmouth will tend to get down deeper in holes and, and a sinking line is almost essential for catching them once the weather cools off. So um, uh, you may need both, depends on the depth in your river. 
How would you add a weed guard to this? Mm. Boy. You could put a weed guard on it. It's just another piece, another thing to tie in. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'd fish a different fly in weedy waters. I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't use this fly. Uh, weighted flies in general, in heavily weighted flies in weeds, uh, are going to be are going to catch weeds anyway with those with those um, lead eyes. It's going to catch weed regardless of whether you have a weed guard in there or not. So I would just I would just use a different fly. I wouldn't use this one in, in weedy waters. I'd pick something else. Any, uh, we have any other questions? I don't think so. All right, everybody. Well, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, it's it's great to have you here. Those are some great questions. Uh, don't don't be shy about asking questions because that's that's what we're here for. It's why we do this live so that you can so that you can ask questions as we go along. Otherwise, you could just watch the reruns on YouTube or, the, or Facebook. So um, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for your questions. Next Monday, I am up against my nemesis, Tim Flagler, and we're going to tie a classic clink hammer. He picked this one. Uh, great fly, great kind of dry slash emerger slash attractor pattern. Uh, works well. Uh, in nearly any kind of trout water in various sizes and colors should be fun. Um, it's not a hard fly to tie, so it's going to be an interesting competition. I'm sure Flagler's got some tricks up his sleeve that he's not telling me about, so we'll see. Anyway, thank you all for tuning in, and um, I will see you on Monday. <laughs>